Westminster Shorter Catechism questions 43 and 44. Question 43. What is the preface to the Ten Commandments? The preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Question 44. What doth the preface to the Ten Commandments teach us? The preface to the Ten Commandments teacheth us that because God is the Lord and our God and Redeemer, therefore we are bound to keep all His commandments. Now, in our last lesson, we considered the moral law of God. We talked about how it is revealed in both nature and in special revelation. Special revelation, of course, is not restricted to the scriptures alone. It's a broader category than the scriptures, though the scriptures are a kind of special revelation. God reveals his word, after all, to the prophets and to the apostles. Some words of which are contained and recorded for us in scripture, but others, and we might even say the majority of the words that he's revealed to the prophets and the apostles, are not recorded. As John says in his gospel, if he were to write everything that Jesus said and did, all the books of the world could not contain the record. But what will concern us here and for our purposes is the law as it is revealed in the pages of Holy Scripture. Scripture is the inspired record of the history of special revelation. And while the moral law is revealed at various points in that history, our attention here for our purposes is going to be the summary of that moral law in the Decalogue. A brief word about context. The moral law of God is always the same. The same. His standard of morality, it never changes. But his demands are revealed in different forms, and they are revealed at different times and for different uses. So when seeking to understand the moral law, the context in which it comes is king. We need to understand the law in the covenantal context in which it is given. And so the preface to the Decalogue is very important here. It sets the law in its redemptive historical context, and in particular, it sets the law in the context of grace. The law must never be confused with saving grace, but saving grace always sets the context for the law when it is given to God's redeemed people. Question 43 explains, quoting from Exodus 20, that the preface to the Decalogue is the identification of the one who is the covenant Lord. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, notice the context here is that of redemption. God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt is an indicative that is to say, it is a statement of fact. It is a statement of redemptive historical fact. And this indic indicative, that is to say, God's great works of redemption and delivering Israel from Egypt, what God has done will form the grounds. It will form the setting of the following imperatives or commands. In other words, God has saved you by his grace. Now go and serve him in gratitude and holiness by keeping his commands. It's important for us to see how this differs from the covenant of works. In the covenant of works, Adam's coming to possess his heavenly reward in which he would gain eternal communion and fellowship with God was on the grounds of his perfect, exact, and entire obedience to the moral law. Adam was to do in order that he might live. But Israel is not commanded to do in order that they might live. Rather, they are made alive first by God's grace in order that they might go on to live according to his commands. So question 43 helpfully notes the gracious context of the law. The fact that it comes within the context of the covenant of grace and not the covenant of works makes a significant difference when interpreting the law. 
Question 44 of the Catechism further clarifies this point. Consider with me an amplification of that point, the words of Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75, where he says that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Or consider what the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Notice here, in these two passages, the indicative and imperative logic. God is our Redeemer. That's the indicative statement of redemptive fact. Therefore, we are bound to obey His commands, the imperatives. Zechariah says it is because of grace that God has delivered us. So that what? That we may live in fear and obedience and holiness and righteousness before Him. Peter explains, because we were ransomed by the blood of Christ, therefore we are to be holy and to live in fear of the Lord. Now in our next lesson, we will get into the nitty-gritty. What does it mean to fear the Lord in the splendor of holiness? It means that we are to love Him with our entire heart, soul, and mind, and to do so with our undivided devotion.